Now, when you sing the blues, you got to be out of the church. I don't believe in being in the church and doing that. You get out. When you join the church, you quit playing. There is no way you can serve two masters. And I'm letting you know, if you serve the Lord, you won't be having them blues no more. You will be rejoicing and singing his praises. Preacher, all I know is everybody has the blues. If you didn't have them yesterday and don't have them today, you're bound to have them tomorrow. So this is the truth. You can rejoice in my Lord and have them blues while he expected. Well, then what do you need the praying to Jesus for? Why he expected? Because he ain't got no blues. Well, then what do you need the praying to Jesus for? They melt horses, don't they? Big Timber is halfway between Deer Lodge and Billings, more Lewis and Clark territory. It looked just about the same as when they came through. The air of the Wild West could be seen and felt in the clothing, architecture, food, and attitudes of the area. It was the wilderness, and the people liked it that way. As long as you're just visiting, then you're welcome. Survivalists like it in Montana and northern Idaho. These were a different breed of people than the ones I hung out with, even though we were survivalists ourselves, allowing us to, well, hell, we fit in just fine. So far, we had survived numerous hangovers, fights, each other, lousy food, and getting screwed. Big Timber was named for its beautiful, strong cottonwood trees. The Yellowstone River was on one side and the Boulder River on the other. The cottonwoods flanked both riverbanks. Once again, it reminded me of how there was nothing like it where I grew up. The home of Motown had the Rouge River, which had stopped moving by the time I left. A little beyond the town of Big Timber were the Crazy Mountains. I asked one of the locals why the mountains were named Crazy, because they looked as sane as any other mountain range I'd seen. I was told in a quiet, this isn't a politically correct story way, that white folklore has it, a woman settler was raped by wild Indians. Her husband and children had been scalped before her eyes. Ever since then, she's been howling up in those mountains. I'd like to hear the Indian side of it. We stopped at the Grand, a combination restaurant and bed and breakfast. Like the rest of Montana, steak was the specialty of the house, and we were up for a real meal. It had a Western motif like everything else in that part of the world. Corey was our designated waitress. While I watched Corey do her job, it reminded me of the definition of acting, reacting honestly in an imaginary situation. In real life, people learn to mask their reactions. Embarrassment, shock, disgust, disagreement, curiosity, not feeling hip, finding a sad scene funny and a funny scene sad, faking orgasm, and being interested are some that come to mind. When you run across someone who doesn't know any better than to react with honesty, they are enviable. I couldn't imagine not being attached to the outcome, not only in the artistic process, but also in real life. How is it possible not to care what people think of you or to not have contracts with the human race? The unsigned contract I carried around in my pocket said, if I feel and act this way, then you should feel and act that way. At the time, there was a lack of definition about my personality, a soft and blurred outline. For I lacked the natural self-protective defenses that many people carry to strengthen themselves against invasion by life's darker aspects. Because of the looseness of my own lines of character, I cared too much about what others thought of me. Corey hadn't signed contracts with the human race. Maybe in a small town you don't have to. But whatever the reason, it was a breath of fresh mountain air to get exactly who she was. The tension was so thick amongst us that having Corey move around us so gentle-like was a blessing. AC was ready to pop. Nina was, too, but I was used to that. Besides, I knew that the reason Nina was unhappy had nothing to do with me, whereas AC triggered in me nothing but guilt. I knew that the leadership thing was getting fuzzy. The only places I could lead myself at this point were to a bar stool and the stage. The rest of the women were handling the tension well. 
All of them had been in show business long enough to know there is always something weird going on when you're out on the road. Actually, Chrissy thrived off of tension. She liked to move through the different camps and pretend she was on their side. We all knew this, of course, so nobody ever told her anything important or anything that she could use against us at a later time. The band managed to get as far away from the drama as possible. Several times I had tried to talk to any one of them about some problem with the women and somehow the subject would get changed faster than you could say, ignore. While everyone was deciding what to order and since I needed to get my mind off the weird vibe, I watched Corey maneuver her way around the restaurant, knowing intuitively where everything was, knowing there was a place for everything, one pocket for pins, one pocket for condiments, one pocket for food tickets. The tasks ahead of her were just part of the flow of the job. Turn up coffee cups, pour coffee, hand out menus, bring drinks, and take orders. Separate checks or all on one? Medium or rare? Over or easy? Bacon or sausage? Link or patty? Soup or salad? What kind of dressing? Mashed, french fried, or baked potatoes? Milk or juice? Medium or large? Pick up the menus, turn in orders, refill coffee cups. Will there be anything else? How is everything? Do you want any dessert? Cash or charge? Everything had a purpose. Everything was necessary. It had rhythm. I ordered steak. I needed red meat because it would help to center me. The grilled flesh would connect me to my environment and help me to attach my tongue to beef country, cattle land. If I'm in Montana, I eat meat. If I'm in Key West, I eat shellfish. If I'm in Seattle, I eat salmon. Do like the natives do, so I ate like the natives. Corey was happy to have new blood to talk to, no matter how strange our blood was. I'm sure we were different than what she was used to. Where are you folks from? Where are you headed? How long you gone for? Are you on vacation? We were happy to talk to New Blood ourselves, and we answered respectively. Seattle, Fargo, North Dakota. A little over two weeks. No, we're working on tour. Corey said what most people say when you tell them you're in the entertainment business. Oh, that must be so much fun, playing music for a living. Chrissy had the answer for that one, vile as usual. If you call ruining our lives fun, yeah, we're having a fucking blast. Just a little cynical. Corey didn't seem to mind that Chrissy was starring in her own B-movie, A Bitch with a View. We tipped big. On our way out, Corey told us to make sure to stop at the town pump. Her husband, Pat, owned and ran the gas station. I said we would because the vehicles needed gas anyway. Tell Pat I sent you. When we drove up, Pat had his head under the hood of a green 1965 Ford pickup. He was oily and dirty from his work. It was hot out, and the flannel shirt had been cut off at the shoulders to accommodate the heat. I walked up to Pat, stuck out my hand, and introduced myself. Before he shook it, Pat casually wiped his filthy hands on his even dirtier jeans. Lenny filled up the gas tanks. Everyone got out as if they hadn't just been out of the van, but the possibility that there might be something to buy in the gas station was just too tempting. Marty and I walked over to the side of the station. He had polish on his hands from cleaning his new guitar while riding in Lenny's rig. The long-legged blues cowboy lit my cigarette and smiled. You hanging in there, Lena? What do you mean? He began to look nervous. This was not friendly territory for me. I didn't need anybody's fucking help or pity. I said, are you all right? Marty, give me a fucking break. Jesus, so I get a little crazy. For God's sake, I'm not some secretary or straight person. I'm a blues singer. It's supposed to get crazy once in a while. Hell, I even like it that way. If I didn't want any action in my life, I'd quit and do something more normal, like get married or whatever normal people do. I could tell Marty was sorry he even brought it up. All right. I just love you and wanted to check in. Ain't no fucking problem. If you say you're under control, then you do. All of a sudden... I didn't feel so in control, but that was a private matter. Right then, Pat joined us, wiping the grease from in between his stubby fingers. Pat had taken a liking to Marty and me. If you and Marty are interested, 
I'll show you my electronic shop. I answered for the two of us. Hey, I'm interested in anything that's different than staring straight ahead and seeing the back end of a van. Marty loved guitars, cars, guns, gear, and electronics, so he was close behind. Pat took us around the back to a large dented steel door and unlocked three deadbolts. When we got a load of what Pat had stashed inside, we were amazed. Marty's mouth hung open. Neither one of us could believe in the back of one pump dilapidated gas station was a room that could only be described as electronic Disneyland. Pat was communicating with gas. This was beyond a hobby. This was his life, his passion. The one pump station was doing what Pat needed it to. The station was paying for his toys. There was so much to take in, I wasn't quite sure what everything was. Pat was ready to communicate and be communicated with. He was attached to the cosmos. If there was a signal out there, he was going to know about it. The electronic boxes squawked, rang, chimed, hissed, clicked, and buzzed. The static was a white noise background to the conversation we were trying to have above the roar. Pat explained, It's important to know what's going on out there. Hear what the human race is saying. See what they're up to. Marty was impressed. Marty's eyes were glazed over with gadget envy, probably the same way my eyes look when seeing the dessert bar at the Sheraton Hotel. Marty was satisfied. He just wanted to touch it. And Pat was satisfied. He could share his passion and keep it mysterious at the same time. It was time to go and move on down the road because Billings was waiting for us. Pat extended his hospitality. You should stay until the evening. Big Timber is having a yearly show that everyone turns out for. I answered for the rest of us. Well, we can't. We got to get going. Why? What's happening? Pat was fussing with one of his gadgets. The Montana Sheep Association puts it on every year. It has to do with why the sheep are important to Montana. Obviously, they didn't know what us outsiders regularly accused them of. Thanks, Pat, but we're on a tight schedule. He understood and waved goodbye. Yes, I did grow up in the land of Ford Motor Company, and the smell of the world's largest factory was at times unbearable. Needless to say, when I was escaping west, the first thing that struck me was the air. The unfamiliar fresh air was intoxicating. Until then, I thought air was supposed to smell bad. Years earlier, I made the drive with my friend Christy Podrowski. He wasn't as impressed as I was, being that he was a hardcore inner-city boy. He grew up underneath the Ambassador Bridge, which connects Detroit to Windsor, Ontario, Canada. The huge, oxidized metal and cement structure spans the Detroit River. The sluggish river had a slick, oily shine to it. The banks of the river were littered with artifacts of the Motor City's population. Tires, broken bottles, and used rubbers. Before he left the Northwest to move back to Detroit, the last thing out of Christie's mouth was, Too many fucking trees here. So he returned home and became a Detroit cop. Christie had gotten pretty tired of my diatribe about the air. I had been commenting on it since Traverse City, Michigan. We had just crossed the Montana border. I would excitedly go on and on while he looked bored. I didn't notice. I was too busy smelling the air. Didn't know it could be like this. The air is smell-free. He nodded. I had a one-track nose. Jesus, I'll never be able to go back to Detroit now. I mean, now that I know the difference. He was stiffening up. Even with my nose in the air, I was starting to notice his change in attitude towards me. But my excitement was making it impossible for my mouth to stop moving. Fuck Detroit, Christy. This air, the trees, man, this is the way life is supposed to be. He had had it. I was fucking with Christy's sacred cow, his hometown. After all, Detroit was Christy's place of birth, his memories, and his identity. That was one of my problems. I'd always assumed if there was something I wanted, then it must be what everyone else wanted. I had assumed all Detroit humans wanted to escape from the Motor City and smell clean air as badly as I did. All of this became moot as soon as we hit Billings. My eyes started to water. We had never smelled anything worse in our lives. I looked at Christy. My God, what are they doing? 
melting down horses? Christy couldn't answer me because he was too busy gasping for air without dead horse smell attached to it. But as we found out soon after getting into town was, yep, that's exactly what they were doing. I didn't know until then that melting down a horse for glue was real. I guess I wanted to believe it was an expression. Remembering Christie's reaction, I couldn't wait to see the groups. None of them had been to Billings before. We pulled into Billings and their reactions were perfect, more than I could hope for. The closer we got, the tighter they pinched their noses. In nasal tones, they started. AC was the first. Oh my goodness, what is that horrible smell? Paula went next. Hey, girlfriend, do these people live here all year long? Nina was a horsewoman and the thought disgusted her. The horses she owned were getting old. As each person climbed out of the vehicles, he or she had some comment about the smell. But seeing Lenny and Vinny's face was worth hard-earned money. Both of them were stoned anyway, which only heightened their senses and dulled their abilities to do anything about it. Shit, this is fucking bad. I don't know if I can stay here. I patted Darth Vader on the back. Don't worry, Lenny. Rooms are air-conditioned. It will be fine as soon as you check in. Vinny wasn't happy. My realizing this wasn't just by the look on his face, but the tears sprouting from his eyes. Oh, man, it never smelled this bad in Chicago. I don't know if I can stand this. These motherfuckers are nuts for living here. Three weeks prior, I had made the reservations at the Hotel Radisson. They had forgotten to mention the glue factory. Oh, yeah, they did mention that in Montana you could take your drinks to go. Drinks to go and no speed limit? The horse thing was becoming less of a problem. I was definitely in God's country. We all checked in. Each group member had a different agenda for spending a Friday night off. I thumbed through the brochures that were courtesy of the hotel. I was looking for something to do besides drink. Maybe I could get some ideas about where to go and quiet the restlessness. Billings had an especially intriguing history. As I read through the tourist literature, I realized there was never any mention of Custer or the glue factory. Custer was nobody to be proud of, so I suppose if they didn't mention him, then maybe he didn't exist. The Chamber of Commerce had a job to do, which was to share what the citizens of Montana are the most proud of. Livestock outnumber the people 12 to 1. No set speed limit during daylight, 65 miles an hour at night. This was my favorite fact. 800 miles from one corner of the state to the other. This is my least favorite fact. Calamity Jane drove a stagecoach in the area. She was notorious for smoking cigars, drinking, and wearing men's clothing. And the point? What I do remember from my own reading was that between Custer and smallpox, the white man just wiped out the Crow Indian. Us whites are some charming motherfuckers. Billings had the same dreary feeling Spokane had, since both cities were built on ancient Indian burial grounds. There was some daylight left, and since the Chamber of Commerce literature wasn't much help, I asked for some ideas at the front desk, and they suggested the Rim Rocks. Lucy and I wanted to take in the local sites. I had heard about the pictographs on the rocks surrounding the city. Like I said, we were in original Crow Indian country. Lucy was up for some adventure, so we were off. I can count on one hand the times I spent alone with Lucy. Each time I did, though, I liked her even more. Lucy's unprotected side was more obvious than the rest of ours, maybe because she was the one that had the whole sexy blues dame thing down. She was a stunning woman to look at but it was near to impossible for any of us to be threatened by those looks because her vulnerability made her so completely accessible. When I looked at Lucy, I often thought of Marilyn Monroe. Lucy was just a darker and taller version. We shared a beer on the drive up to the Rim Rocks. While driving up the hills, Lucy and I passed a warm can of beer back and forth. When the road ended, we got out and had to climb a bit. Neither Lucy or I were climbers, but the grunting and unfamiliar exercise was worth it. The brochures had informed us the cliffs were left over from the inland sea millions of years ago. It was difficult to believe there was ever a sea there because all that remained were the dry, jagged cliffs. 
The area was magic. We stood looking at the sandstone with the sun setting as a backdrop. And oh, God, there were beautiful sunsets in Montana. They have to be huge to fill the endless sky. Lucy and I sat up on the rocks for a long spell. We were quiet most of the time. We couldn't think of anything more important to say than what we were in the presence of. I was happy to be quiet while admiring Lucy's looks. She was put together so well. Her long black hair was casually pulled back in a ponytail. It was as if she appointed particular hairs to fall around her face as sexily as possible. Lucy had on our group's T-shirt. It read, We are not good girls. The words were printed across the front in shocking pink letters underneath the bright red pair of lips. The lower half of her was encased like a sausage in skin-tight blue jeans. Lucy regularly customized her T-shirts. The manufacturers didn't just make them sexy enough for her. She would take her special scissors out of her special pouch and cut the arms and bottom half off the new T-shirt. Most places we played had a T-shirt to advertise their goods, and Lucy always managed a free one. I don't remember anyone ever saying no to her. How could they? The thought of their goods being promoted on her incredible body was an advertising opportunity they just couldn't pass up. Like Hansel and Gretel, there was a trail that could be followed by Lucy's bits of cloth cut and dropped along the way. My eyes kept going back and forth from the sandstone cliffs to the jagged bottom edge of Lucy's shirt, which fell dangerously close below the lower curves of her braless tits. I found myself looking at Lucy most of the time, making sure the shirt didn't go higher than it was supposed to, and at the same time kind of hoping it would. She had perfect breasts. The shirt never did go up too far. It was damned uncanny. Of course, the Jessica Rabbit of the Blues didn't give any of this a thought, while the rest of us were a bit consumed by the phenomenon. Lucy's words interrupted the silence. Did you know my dad was a jazz musician? Yeah, you've mentioned it before. He was, still is, his name is Reginald Winder. I was shocked. You mean the piano player? Yeah, that's the one, honey. God, Lucy, he's a wonderful player. Yeah, anyway, sometimes he'd let me sit under the piano when he would rehearse in the living room. He'd say to me, if you're real quiet, I'll let you sit under the piano. But you got to be real quiet. So I'd sit with my legs crossed under that baby grand and soak in all them sounds, honey. I couldn't get enough of the music or my dad. I was crazy about my old man. Lucy sipped from her beer can, thinking a little more before she spoke. One night, while I was sitting under the piano, my dad asked me if I wanted to sit on his lap. I mean, this was nothing he'd ever done before. So, of course, I'm all excited. Then he wanted to know if I was up for learning how to play a C chord. Well, you bet I did. Anything to please the old man. He shows me where to put my fingers and them big white keys. And I got to tell you, I am concentrating real hard, honey. I'm going to learn that C chord. He tells me to keep practicing so the next time he asks to see it, I can show him. I practice that chord over and over again. I didn't know it would be the last time I'd ever see my dad. He never came home after that night. I don't think he had much use for my sister or me. Lucy kept swallowing. Somehow it was keeping the tears from falling over the ridges of her eyes. The quiet of the rocks replaced the space that Lucy's words had taken up. She took a long drag off her long cigarette and looked at me. You can bet I still remember how to play that C chord, honey. And then to herself in almost a whisper, she repeated it. I still remember how to play that fucking C chord. She had on full makeup, but the little girl still showed through. I swallowed several times while I reached over and squeezed her hand. Lucy always managed to break my heart. I looked at her with all that makeup on. Lucy loved nature, but hated natural. To Lucy, there was a difference between the two. There she sat on the sandstone all made up, I liked how it looked, a modern, made-up woman perched on ancient rock, a visual aberration. It was what it was. The evening was growing dark enough to allow the moon and stars to make their nightly appearance. The sky was heavy with a silver shimmer, making it almost impossible for the black of night to show through. 
Neither one of us had ever seen anything like it. Lucy and I had neck aches the following day from gazing at the stars. She had a couple of beers with her. I didn't like beer, but that was no time to be fussy. I'd been known to consume the blue liquid used to clean combs at four in the morning when there was nothing else to drink. The two of us were running out of our own private thoughts. We began to talk again. Lucy wanted to tell me about her new boyfriend, a trumpet player whom she was in love with. His name was Rick Osgood. Rick was a good man, and he had asked Lucy to move in with him. Even though he was 15 years younger than she was, he was a stable guy with a condo, and he had his own restaurant supply business besides the music thing. Lucy looked like a child receiving its first toy. I knew Lucy had had a rough time of it, and she'd come a long way. Not long ago, Jessica Rabbit was sleeping in her car. Oh, honey, that man is so good to me. He never tells me what to do. Because Rick plays music, he understands me being out on the road. He wants me to help him with the daytime business. You know, honey, answer the phones, a receptionist kind of thing. I'd known Lucy for a while. I couldn't imagine what she would wear to the office. Everything she owned was tight and very short. She was always in full-stage makeup. Typing would be a problem. Her nails were bright red and an inch long, and she couldn't get by most sentences without the word honey dripping off of it. I could hear her at 8.30 in the morning. Good morning, honey. Have I got supplies for you? I wasn't going to say anything, though. Lucy was enjoying the champagne glass she was lounging in. I had no desire to steal the bubbles that were tickling her all over. She took another long, slow drink from the open mouth of that lucky beer can and continued to talk. The sex is the best I've ever had, honey. He knows how to make me happy. Oh, honey, that man knows what I like. I don't have to tell him how to do a thing. First man I've ever been with that really knows how to satisfy me. It's good to talk to another woman about these things. When we women gossip, it's how I find out my life just ain't unique. Good lovers are hard to find, rare. You begin to think, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I'm sending out the wrong signals. At times, I guess we are. But then there are those times you can send out all the right beacons you want to and all you will get is someone who isn't paying attention. The bottom line is, due to the lack of mom emancipation, there just aren't many good men out there to receive those signals. Our necks were getting stiff and sore. So Lucy and I changed positions by lying on our backs. Again, there wasn't much left to say. The stillness was easeful. The quiet gave my head room to relax and think about how happy I was for Lucy. I knew she liked to cook and keep house, and now she could for someone that mattered. Lucy couldn't wait to paint the walls in the condo, texturizing with a sponge dipped in gold. She was going to nest and get a taste of the normal life for the first time ever. Lucy was 40 years old, and her Ferris wheel had come to a stop for a little while. She had struggled with her blues for a long time. As we drove back, my thoughts were on Bo. Even though life had been hard for Lucy, I was a bit jealous of her solid relationship with Rick. I couldn't stop myself from imagining what it would be like to set up house with Bo, the bartender, How normal it would be to sit across the breakfast table and ask, Would you like more toast, dear? What time will you be home from work today? Would you mind picking up the kids from school? As I let my mind wander out a little further, I knew as much as I thought I wanted a normal life, it was one of those things I was most afraid of. I had strived my whole life to be a rebel and a unique individualist. I had no desire to make peace with a slightly less glossy and glamorous stereotyped self-image. I was frightened of being rejected because I was too ordinary. When real life squeezed through my perennial, one day when I grow up fear of incompetence, what the eyes of the world saw as grown-up was a threat. I knew that someday I would have to accept some of the limitations of ordinary life, which included my own needs, because in the final analysis, life would not exempt me. No matter how talented and special I thought I was, I would have to make peace with the fact that I was the same as everybody else. It was Saturday morning, and I didn't want to get up and drive. Sleep was utmost on my mind. We were facing 600 miles, 
I usually route it better, but at the time I didn't have a choice. There was nothing I could do about the next two days, so I would just have to like it. I'm fairly sure the most boring drive in the country is through North Dakota, but this time Art did not imitate life because traveling with me were Nina and Paula. I had made the trip before, so I was ready for the nothing-to-look-at factor in a state that never ended. The trip ahead was a non-ending, boring state of nothing, which sort of reminded me of my career. It was time for the serious blues. I rummaged around between the seats. Where was my Delta Blues tape? Ah, there. I blew off the dust, dirt, and cigarette ash that had accumulated on top of my precious music. Why don't you be like me? Why don't you be like me? Just drink good whiskey, boy, and let the cocaine be. Buck up to me. Buck up to you. That's the way my honey do. I felt better already. We had breakfast first. The group felt good from the previous night's sleep, which made the conversation more lively than usual. Even Nina was talking up a storm. That Roy Orbison show should be a lot of fun. I have been listening to him ever since I was a teenager. I don't even care about opening for him. It'll be an honor just to be standing that close to Sir Orbison. I bet he sounds exactly the same. I saw Roy on cable a couple of weeks ago, and he looked and sounded just like I remembered him. I hope it's okay for us to take pictures because I brought my camera. This whole crazy trip is worth the chance to see Roy in person, don't you think? Nina wasn't looking for anyone to answer her. And anyway, it had seemed like such a long time since she acted like herself that nobody wanted to interrupt her excitement. None of us had gotten drunk the night before, which helped. I felt so good when I didn't drink that it was beyond me why I kept doing it. Doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and expecting different results certainly is the definition of insanity. The boys in the band were raring to go while the women were getting into gear just a bit slower, only because we have more moving parts than the band. But if you were a man traveling with the women's show, you learned how to flip the switch that said, don't push them to hurry up or they will get cranky. These guys were no wimps, but up against us, any man was dead meat. We didn't survive in bars by looking good. We had all developed our serrated-like wit like an electric knife. We could cut through anything. As always, the organized chaos of the caravan would come together and head on out. The mule train was going east. Get on, little doggies. Yeah, you betcha. We are head for the wilderness of North Dakota. Monkey on my back. Monkey. When the Lord call you you got to make sure you're not lost. And that fact always stayed on my mind. you got to know the way of the Lord. If you play blues, you're on an occupation of your own. you just out on your own. Well, the Lord can't get no glory out of you when you play blues. See the Lord get glory out of you. Such a thing as playing church songs, that's how. He gets glory out of us. What you got to say to me, J.D. Short? Memphis Minnie used to play the guitar, and she'd make the guitar say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Pray, brother, pray. Save poor me. Now that's what Memphis Minnie's guitar would say. She'd play that music so the Lord could find her, and I'm telling you the truth, or they don't call me Jelly Jaw. If you can't have what you want, change what you want, or lower your expectations. Our next stop would be in Dickinson, North Dakota, land of giants. The population was largely made up of Norwegians, Swedes, and Germans. These are a hearty people with huge appetites. They are big people who care about growing large things. Yes, it is a big land with big people planting big crops so they could eat their big meals, especially when living through those big winters, only to look forward to the big summers in them, big open spaces, making room for those big floods. Every time I've traveled through North Dakota, I am struck by the same thing. There is nothing there. There aren't any people, buildings, nothing. 
These facts are more proof to me why there is such a belief as destiny. Why would anyone live there by choice unless they were destined to? I don't believe a human being would get up one morning and say to themselves, hey, where can I go live and freeze my ass off for six months out of the year? Then, when I can't stand that anymore, for the next six months, I can fry in temperatures over 100 degrees. It will be someplace where I will have no one to complain to about the weather because I don't have any neighbors. Somewhere, I'll have nowhere to go because there's nothing there. Wait, there's North Dakota. I wonder how fast I can pack my belongings and move my ass out there. Of course, on the positive side, North Dakota does boast having the fewest violent crimes, but then again, I bet there aren't many crimes in the Sahara Desert either. They even have a Visitor's Appreciation Day. The citizens of North Dakota must be so gosh darn glad that anybody has shown up, they created a special day to honor them. Maybe I'm not being fair. In the scenery department, the North Dakota tourist brochures boast about their prairie potholes, holes with water in them. In Seattle, we call them ponds. Whenever I get on my soapbox about North Dakota, people invariably respond with, the Badlands are cool. Yeah, and in Detroit, the Art Institute is cool, but it's not a good reason to live there. Legend has it that the Dakota Indians, who were sometimes called the Lakotas, were astral travelers practicing out-of-body travel. Other tribes describe them as the flyers. I have no doubt all of this is true. If my choice were a teepee with a campfire for heat stuck for the winter in North Dakota, I too would develop astral travel capabilities. In August, cold temperatures were not the issue. It was 103 degrees. It had cooled down a little. Like any self-respecting blues van, there was no air conditioning. All the windows were rolled down, allowing the hot air to blow through, which was limiting the conversation. The roar of the road and the rush of the wind in my ears were making it impossible to hear. And because of the heat, we were afraid to stop because there would be a meltdown if we did. So we just kept moving since it was the only way. If we drove until we had to stop, that would be Dickinson. I needed to see something else besides flat land. I was getting an attitude. It happened every time I had to drive through North Dakota. Maybe it would have been more tolerable if we had air conditioning or a decent stereo. Or maybe if the women weren't sleeping and would wake up and talk to me. Then again, maybe if I had something to drink that was more interesting than fucking diet pop. Maybe if I wasn't on this road for half my life. Maybe if there was a stand-up comic in the passenger seat, a really funny one. Maybe then I would have a better attitude about this boring-ass drive. Finally, I had to resign myself to the stiff rhythm of the flat North Dakota land. I popped in a favorite old tape of mine, Edgar Winter's White Trash Recycled Tape. Was one of the rare white boys that could sing those cigarette-smoking barrel house blues. I didn't know the words to many tunes, but this tape was different because the words made sense, and I had heard them a hundred times. Oh, I got them in and out of love, in and out of love blues. It helped my North Dakota boredom to sing along. Everyone was asleep. I still had the same crew with me. I was glad that Paula was dealing with Nina, because for her it had been a long time since she'd been laid. Ten days. Again, we would soon be paying the price for her dry spell. As I looked out over the land, it triggered the feelings I was so good at storing away in a steel locker. Thoughts of Bo were painful. I wasn't able to think of how I felt about him because there would be little thoughts riding humpback on bigger ones. There I would be with a vision of Bo and I in love. Then the picture would dissipate into how he would leave me, and frankly, the state of mind I was in at the time, I couldn't have handled the pain. For a little extra seasoning of fear-filled thoughts, I kept thinking how I had to quit boozing it up, but still, I couldn't imagine my life without liquor. Not having the luxury of altering my state of mind when I had an uncomfortable moment, which was quickly becoming most of them, was unthinkable. The loneliness caused by my reliance on whiskey far outweighed the pain of thinking of Bo. The fear of feeling anything was causing a slow, rotting deterioration of my heart, which created a flatness in me that could be matched only by the land that was helping to trigger the fear in the first place. As I looked out over the barren horizon, 
I remember reading about the Aborigines and how they believe they have sung the world into existence. When on a walkabout, the small, dark men sing out the name of everything that may cross their path, plants, rocks, and animals. As we moved through the empty country, I thought, if I knew how, I could leave a scattering trail of words and musical notes along the way. The melody would be our direction finder. All of North Dakota would be a musical score. The song would be our existence. But I had a feeling that these Dakotans couldn't carry much of a tune. The signs of civilization were beginning to appear more frequently, signs for Dickinson telling us we were 50 miles away. Then more signs, dinosaurs. Ten dinosaurs living in Dickinson. They lived in the Dakota Dinosaur Museum. Maybe that's why there weren't many people. Maybe it wasn't the harsh conditions at all. I bet you a long time ago, the dinosaurs ate them. Yeah, you betcha. Dickinson is also home to Dickinson State University. I don't think the Dakotans felt the university was as important as the dinosaurs. There were 11 road signs for dinosaurs and one for the college. It made sense somehow, the people being so big and everything. After we ate, I wanted to stop and see the dinosaurs. We didn't have dinosaurs in Detroit. This was a great opportunity. I was outvoted 11 to 1. Let's go eat. When on the road, there were some surefire establishments that suited the cheap, unimaginative driver's needs. You could count on them being consistent, familiar, professional, void of personality, ready to serve, close to the highway, and giving you your mediocre money's worth. The ones we'd run into most often were Ramada Inn, Holiday Inn, Motel 6, Dairy Queen, McDonald's, Burger King, Denny's, and Perkins. Out of the bunch, Perkins was my favorite pick. You would get a lot for your money, and sometimes it's better to go for quantity than it is quality, like a car on empty. Just fill her up. I've got a long way to go. Perkins was the place. Lenny was leading the pack. He knew a Perkins when he saw one. He knew what we liked, and more importantly, he knew what I liked. I was starving, and when the rest woke up, food would be an issue. I felt dirty, sticky, hot, and dusty from too much driving. If the women's hair was long enough, it was in a ponytail or bun pulled on top of their sweaty heads. We all had on shorts and t-shirts. That is, everyone except Lenny. He was still dressed in Darth Vader black and still sweating like a pig. Perkins looked like it was supposed to. It was the same as the rest in the chain. The interior was made up of plastic earth tones. The waitress's uniforms matched the decor, relieving my hot, tired eyes of any challenging color schemes. The hostess set us up and back. Hostesses in small towns always did that. It served their purpose twofold. Made sure we didn't mingle with the regular folk, and it was usually the smoking section, which was good because all but two of us smoked like chimneys. Paula and Nina didn't. Paula never complained about the smokers. Nina wouldn't shut up about it. Though this day would be different. Nina couldn't complain because all of a sudden she wasn't speaking to me. Thank God for huge favors. Though the ten of us were seated in back, we had divided up into smaller groups. All of us were getting sick of each other and the hot temperatures were shortening our tempers. Paula, Nina, and I sat together. Dressed in brown and orange, an overworked waitress took our orders. In an I-don't-have-all-day sort of voice, she asked, Are you ready to order? She scared me. I hurried and passed the buck. I'm not. You go first, Paula. I knew I could count on Paula. She always ordered the same usual healthy lunch. I have a small green salad and the soup of the day. Oh, and girlfriend, please, no dressing on that salad. I'd appreciate it if you served it on the side. I was always blown away by Paula's discipline. A few times, I've experienced discipline myself. It certainly wasn't when I was on the road, exhausted. I needed my strength to stand behind my temporary convictions. The waitress didn't use food tickets and remembered all of the orders. On my best day waitressing, I couldn't have done that. Like most of the waitresses working in fast food places along the open highways, it was a career. What women may be doing for the rest of their lives. Waitressing wasn't something they were doing in the interim like we had. She remembered the orders quickly. Her long blonde hair was escaping from the clip that was desperately trying to hold it in place. 
She turned to AC. What would you like? AC loved grains and starch, cereal, oatmeal, bread, and potatoes. I'd like the oatmeal with fruit. When buying snacks for the road trip, AC would bring Rice Krispies, Life, shredded wheat, mix them up with each other, and then eat her crunchy original snack right out of the box with the combined cereals in it. That would be followed up with a Kit Kat, jumbo size. This sturdy waitress had definitely grown up on a farm. I bet you she would rather be pitching hay than waiting for me to make up my mind about what I wanted to eat. She didn't have time for the stupid shit. Since I couldn't make up my mind, I went for size. How much could they get on one plate? Now what comes with the Grand Slam breakfast? She answered like a programmed robot. Three eggs, bacon, toast, pancakes, hash browns, juice, and coffee. Perfect. I'll take it. She sure did scare me. Give me a city girl to scrap with any time. Those country gals were a species I didn't understand. When I came back from going to the bathroom, A.C. grabbed me. Nina was getting on her nerves with her aloof attitude. A.C. was gnawing on a blueberry muffin and was clearly upset. You could hear it in her muffled muffin tones. Nina is wound up. I mean, really wound up. I've put my time in. I've got enough to do. I mean, a lot to do. I can't be trying to make her happy. A.C. suffered from the same codependency traits as me. It was our job to fix the broken, but Nina was unfixable. You're right. We should share. So now, how are you going to tell her that she can't ride with you anymore? Why should I tell her? Why should I tell her? You're the band leader. You should do it. I see, A.C. What you're telling me is that I should walk up to Nina and say, Hey, A.C. is sick of you, so stay away from her. Yeah, A.C., I think she will really go for that explanation. Jesus, she's meaner than a snake when I'm nice to her. You can tell her. We'll tell her that you want her to ride with you forever. I can tell you thought about this for a while. Yeah, well, it's survival of the fittest out here. Huh. I always thought it was survival of the meanest. Whatever, I'll talk to her. Nina had moved and was now sitting with the band. I guess any male attention, even the kind that wasn't the least bit interested in her, was better than nothing. I hated to interrupt her purring and rubbing, but I needed to get this over with. Hey, Nina, would you mind riding with me from now on? I could really use your friendly chatter. I'm going out of my mind with boredom. I hate this stretch of road. She looked weary. Nina didn't know if I was being sarcastic, a bitch, or if I really meant it. Miss Horny Toad answered, All right. Every time that woman ended up in my van, I was sure it was some sort of cosmic punishment. Maybe I had tortured small animals in my last life. Maybe I had beat children. It was something bad, though, because Nina was hard work. The longer the trip, the more work it became. These scenarios were partly her fault. The longer she was away from home meant the longer she hadn't gotten laid, so therefore the more ornery she got. And then it was partly my fault. The longer I was on the road meant the more I drank, causing me to feel worse, which created less patience for everyday life. Nina and I were a volcanic situation, and the volcano was starting to bubble. People in the band were beginning to look for cover. The waitress had returned. She would keep coming back to her job was done like the Terminator. She had all of our orders with her and condiments, too. I looked down at my plate and saw that my food was friendlier than she was. I thought it best if I said something nice. I just love the food and service at Perkins. Whenever we are on the road, I insist on stopping. She could not be charmed and looked at me like I was nuts. She rolled her eyes and handed us the bill. We tipped big. All ex-waitresses do. I've heard old waitresses never die. They just change their stations. I believe it. I still empty everyone's ashtrays. As the waitress was leaving for her next order and counter, I could hear her voice trailing off in a flat tone. I'll be back. I didn't think I'd wait. How could I miss her when she wouldn't go away? As Nina sat in the passenger seat, her mood grew darker. I tried to make small talk. How are you holding up, Nina? Is everything okay with you? Oh, you know, I'm fine. Maybe I would take a different approach. I sure am looking forward to opening up for Roy Orbison. Aren't you? Yeah, should be fun. The conversation was like a bad interview. Instead of talking to Nina anymore, I decided to banish her to the evil part of my brain and get even that way. I have a 15-year-old Lynx Point tabby cat named Thor. 
I had an epiphany and realized Thor and Nina have the same attitude. So what if I'm needy? Demand attention all the time, no matter what you're doing. You are going to have to pet me, so do it right now. And if you don't, I will stick my claws into you until you scream, because after all, my whole purpose in life is to be loved and noticed and touched. I love him. And I loved her. But he is an obnoxious animal, and she was an obnoxious friend. They both were relentless pet-me whores, just touch-me whores. With her traits of a bird and my cat, she was the embodiment of the cat that ate the canary. I would watch her pick up a scent of an available hostage, and she'd quickly maneuver him into bed. He must have felt something like Thor's battered mice and AC's Kirby victims. Did I really just buy a vacuum cleaner? Did I just go to bed with someone? Was I just swallowed up by a 20-pound cat? But sex wasn't enough. After sex, she wanted to be in a euphoric, wasn't that orgasm the best, so just stroke me, hold me, touch me, desire me forever as I wait on you, hand and foot state of mind. Most men didn't have the same dialogue in their heads. The ones that did consider her as a potential mate were driven away quickly by her incessant demands for attention. I watched one man physically pushing her away as she was trying to land a big old French kiss on him. He had been pawed enough. It was time to go watch TV. We have PMS and they have ESPN. Their quick escape was a perpetual heartache for her. Nina never knew what went wrong, and I learned a long time ago it wasn't a good idea for me to point it out for three reasons. First, it was none of my business. Second, I might be wrong. Third, people have their own time frame for getting new information. It has nothing to do with my personal clock. A carnival! I jumped out of my transcendent state, which had been caused by my momentary silent hatred for Nina. What? Nina was really excited. A carnival! Pull over! She didn't have to convince me. I was on it. I pounded on the horn to get AC and Lenny's attention so they would stop. This is just what the doctor ordered for my boredom. We stopped on the side of the road. As soon as the van stopped moving, the wall of heat hit me square in the face. I tried to ignore it and approached the others. Lenny and AC were up for a little excitement. We could kill a couple of hours eating cotton candy and riding rides that wouldn't be the least bit scary, but none of us cared. We were bored, and it was a new road adventure. The people running this particular carnival were definitely outcasts from society, even more than we were. The woman that ran the arcade game where you throw round multicolored plastic rings on top of Coke bottles had facial hair and was one of the fattest people I had ever seen. As she sat and watched everyone fail at the impossible task, the bearded woman absentmindedly gnawed a corn dog on a stick. Each bite was determined and slow, as if the stick rammed through the poor dog wasn't enough torture. She disgusted Chrissy. You'd think she'd fucking shave or fucking lose weight. I mean, did she ever hear the word diet? AC didn't like when we trashed someone. She was the defense for the common man. It's too bad the job didn't pay because AC would be a rich woman. Chrissy, you don't know why she's like the way she is. Maybe she had a horrible life. There might be a good reason she looks like that. Yeah, right. I can't think of any reason I wouldn't fucking use a 50-cent razor. Everyone decided to meet at the Ferris wheel in a couple of hours. Paula and I hung out together. We wanted to see if there was anything to buy. There wasn't. So we sat on a wooden bench eating blue cotton candy and people watched. I could see Lenny by the pony rides. The woman that was in charge looked like a female version of him. She had on black jeans, a black t-shirt, black cowboy boots, black sunglasses, and a black baseball cap with long black hair sticking out of the cap's back vent. There they both stood in black, soaking up the heat, looking cool. I could tell even from where I was sitting, Lenny liked her. He was real animated for Lenny. His head and hands were moving at the same time. I wondered why he was bothering. We were leaving in an hour, so he didn't have a chance in hell of sleeping with her. Paula and I both had blue tongues from our afternoon delight. Each time I put the sugary blue hair in my mouth, I wondered why I didn't skip eating cotton candy and just lick the inside of a sugar bowl. But there the two of us sat, in our mid-forties with blue tongues in North Dakota at a roadside carnival without saying a word. What was there to say? 
It was about time to rendezvous with the rest of the crew. We would all have a small story to share from our two-hour visit, which was good, because the drive to Fargo was the most boring of all. The area between Dickinson and Fargo must be where Flatland came to die. Jesus, I hadn't even seen a building for a couple of hours, not even a shack. Chrissy wanted to smoke, so she was in my vehicle. I was getting dizzy from the women playing musical vans. Chrissy, Nina, and Paula were now my partners in boredom. So much of the road could be uneventful. I was running out of things to keep me occupied. Finding the rhythm was close to impossible in places like North Dakota. I adjusted the way I was sitting by putting my left foot up on the dash and leaning back in the seat. I began to count the mile markers as the tires rolled over the seams in the road, counting a second line to the rhythm that I was trying to establish. I would try and clear my mind to a state of nothingness until it was empty. Same as the land, flat, nothing, miles and miles and miles of road meditation. Ram Das meets Jack Kerouac. Chrissy had been real quiet. I began to worry like a soldier patrolling through the jungle. When it's silent, you become concerned. What's going on, Chrissy? You're awfully quiet. I met a guy. Well, that's cool. You mean before we left Seattle? No. You mean at one of the gigs? No. I was confused. Where else could she have met someone? Oh, no. It couldn't be. You didn't meet him at the carnival, did you? Yes. No wonder she hadn't said anything. She was going to get mass shit for this one. What do you mean you met him? Does that mean once and you'll never see him again? Or does that mean he will write you sometime? Or that he'll give you a call when he's in Seattle? I want to know what you mean you met him. Chrissy was embarrassed. I knew this because she hadn't told me to fuck off yet. I'm going to meet him in Fargo. They're going to be there tomorrow. What do you mean they? You mean his family? No, the carnival will be in Fargo and Spokane at the same time as us. I couldn't believe it. I could only imagine our blues caravan and the carnival people speeding down the highway side by side, exchanging food, drugs, alcohol, war stories, and interbreeding techniques. I leapt without a net. So what does he do? Chrissy answered proudly. During the day, he runs the concession stand. At night, he's the main fucking attraction. I was confused. Did people come to see him fill up the Coke machine? What are you talking about? Chrissy was even prouder. Didn't you see the marquee? At night, they put on a small show, and he is the fucking star. I had been busy eating blue cotton candy. I hadn't seen any marquees. Sorry, Chrissy, I didn't see the marquee. He's the rocket man. They shoot him out of a rocket. Isn't that cool? He's the fucking rocket man. I was stunned. The conversation was too weird. Maybe if I asked normal questions, I would get normal answers. What's his name, Chrissy? Roger. Roger the Rocket Man. Well, at least Chrissy would no longer have to sing to get that rocket on her back feeling. She could go straight to the source. Chrissy? Yeah? Tell me, if a carnival couple gets a divorce, will they still be brother and sister? Fuck you. Signs for Fargo started to appear. Nina raised her head. Roger the Rocket Man? Mmm, you know, I bet he knows how to really do it. I was just trying to ignore the weirdness. I had a bad feeling about those carnival people following us from town to town. Chrissy wanted to change the subject. How far do we have to go? I had established a fierce rhythm and I didn't feel like talking anymore. I had an inner dialogue going on that was preferable to speaking out loud. But it was Chrissy, and the price of not answering her would be too high. We're almost to Fargo. She looked at me, puzzled. No, I said, how far do we have to go? That's what I said. We're almost in Fargo. Oh, I get it. Fargo is the largest city in North Dakota with 80,000 people within the city limits, which isn't many people considering the size of the state. Directly across the Red River sits Moorhead, Minnesota, and like the rest of North Dakota, the area is predominantly Norwegian transplants. Before the Norwegians were the Sioux and Lakotas, but there wasn't any sign of them when we were there. When I inquired about the locations of the reservations, nobody seemed to know or care very much 
and just seemed to have them. The best answer I got was, somewhere about 300 miles north, I think. At the turn of the century, Fargo was known as the 10-minute divorce town. The reason for the name was there were so many lawyers and divorce laws. Disgruntled people traveled from all over the world to Fargo, anxious for their quickie divorces. Because those unhappy soon-to-be singles needed to be entertained, the town had more going on than most at the time with its elegant restaurants, classy hotels, opera house, billiard rooms, and social centers. There was barely a remnant left of past history. We had to take their word for it. Like Seattle, San Francisco, and Chicago, Fargo burnt to the ground. In the 1890s, a female proprietor of a grocery store threw hot coals out back. By evening, all that was left of Fargo were ashes. I bet she did it on purpose, because if there was nowhere to live, she wouldn't have to stay there anymore. I found all this interesting, but what really intrigued me were the signs for cheese buttons. Nina was coming around after slipping off for a short nap. I wanted someone to talk to, even though it was Nina. I turned to her and in my most friendly, I really like you voice, asked, what do you think cheese buttons are? My being fake friendly was duly noted. How the fuck am I supposed to know? Why not ask some goddamn Norwegian? I ignored her wicked tongue. Yeah, you're right. I'll ask them about the buried fish, too. If she didn't get laid soon, I would fuck her myself. I was excited because I knew that the concert promoters were putting us up in a wonderful place called the Country Suites. It had everything we would ever need, plus some. A free continental breakfast for Chrissy, a newspaper delivered in the morning for those of us who cared about local happenings, which would be me. In each room were a refrigerator, a microwave, and a coffee maker, making it handy for beer, heating up leftovers from hospitality, and waking up in the morning. There was also an indoor pool, whirlpool, and exercise facility. I hadn't exercised in a couple of years, but it was reassuring to know that if I wanted to, I could. In addition to all these luxuries was the country pub and casino. Now we're talking. Gambling would be fun and a great way to wind down after the job. A great way to get away from everyone. A great way to stop thinking about how much I hated Nina. The hotel clerk sounded as mechanical as the slot machines in the background. It's so nice to have you stay here with the country pub and casino family. Please call down to the front desk if you can't find what you need. She was a bright light on the prairie. Like the rest of the North Dakotans, she had a robust look to her, a round, fresh face which was surrounded by a blonde page boy giving her an even friendlier look. The fluffy-looking receptionist kept her dog in a pink straw hat basket on the hotel counter. The dog's name, Miss Foof, was embroidered in pale lavender on the front of the pink and white satin pillow. The dog's small, pushed-in face was framed by her blonde page boy. The top of Miss Foof's hair was pulled up with a scarlet red ribbon, perfectly matching her mother's silk jacket. Not only was the ribbon a fashion statement, but it enabled the little fluffy dog to see. The brass nameplate next to the register on the marble counter said, Hello, my name is Sharon. Sharon straightened the bow on Miss Foof while offering more information. We have a brochure available for our customers' convenience. It has not only the hours, but the rules of the casino, pub, workout rooms, and pool. Her manner was blunt but soft, somewhere in between la-la-la and a subtle go-get-fucked. We were playing the next day on the artistic banks of Red River. The concert was part of the music series put on by the Chamber of Commerce. I was weak with the prospect of appearing on the same stage with the Southern musical legend Roy Orbison. When I was 10 years old, the first album I bought was Roy Orbison's Greatest Hits. There I was, 30 years later, on the same stage with one of my first true musical loves. I, along with everyone else, had a lot riding on this show. We had driven a long way for an opportunity to be heard and respected by someone important. We didn't get much respect where we hailed from, and there are times when an artist has to go through many lengths to be appreciated. We wouldn't be the first musicians to drive hundreds of miles for a little pay and a lot of respect, but I wasn't there for just my own selfish reasons. The show needed a good psychological hit. B.B. King was wonderful, but all it did was whet our appetites for more. 
Even though I had my head up my ass feeling sorry for myself most of the time, I could feel the tension building. We were all a bit desperate. All of us, except for AC, were in our 40s with no signs of things getting any better. Our frightened feelings not only caused us pain, but made us more competitive with each other. We needed some relief from our self-imposed expectations. Tomorrow would come soon enough, and since it was a Saturday evening, we had time to kill. Everyone had a bug up his or her butt to go and do something. You could shovel the excitement we were all feeling. None of the crew could sit still. I wanted to spend my Saturday night with some men, even if it was my band. I love women, but you could get tired of Labradors if that's all you ever saw, talked with, slept next to, and were trapped in a van with. The band was going bar hopping. I begged, please, you guys, can I go with you tonight? I promise I won't get in the way of you meeting girls. Sam, in his true Pee Wee impersonation, grabbed my arm. Sure you can. You're way too much fun. Meet me in front of the Roger Maris Museum. The Roger Maris Museum was located in the local shopping mall. Sam didn't care about the ambiance. True to form, if there was anything around to do with baseball, Sam was on it like cat on nip. I couldn't wait. I'll meet you in an hour and a half. I got to get cleaned up. I called down to the front desk. Is this Sharon? Yes, Lena. How may I help you? Maybe they should have a robot do her job. I bet you have a pulse on what's going on around here. We're planning on the Roger Maris Museum, but what else do you suggest? She thought for a moment. Have you looked through the travel brochures in your room? They're full of good ideas. No, I haven't. Thanks, Sharon. I'll take a look. I looked through the brochures left in the hotel room. Fargo's community profile. It didn't matter what city or town you visited. You were never given the kind of information you actually wanted in those damn brochures. Information like the cheapest bar. What's within walking distance? Where's a good place to have breakfast? The location of secondhand stores. Where we could find live music anywhere close. Is there good barbecue? This brochure was no different. Its listings included... Bag Bonanza Farm, the only restored Bonanza Farm in the United States. Bonanzaville, USA, a reconstructed pioneer village. Gooseberry Park Players, outdoor summer drama for children. It went on and on. Wait, what's this? The Walk of Fame, a Hollywood in the Midwest starring Neil Diamond, Garth Brooks, Bob Costas, and the Eagles in Cement? What baseball was to Sam, celebrity was to me. Their lives seemed so much more glamorous than mine did. I bet Anne Margaret didn't drive a van full of equipment from town to town. She had people who did that for her. People to do her hair and wash the dishes. I couldn't wait. Whose hand would fit mine? I had a new mission as I hurried and got dressed. I didn't want to wear any old thing. We might hit a casino, and now I was headed for the Walk of Fame. Let's see. I'll wear the snakeskin boots brand new jeans, silk blouse, and linen jacket, pulled my hair up, and smeared on plenty of makeup. I was dressed and made up in 20 minutes. The rockets were burning out of control, and so I had just set a new record for getting ready. There I stood in front of Elegant Express Printing and Binding Company looking for my soulmate in cement. Okay, it wasn't Hollywood, but that was just one small detail. I was overcome. It is Metallica, Alan Jackson, Aerosmith, Moody Blues, and Billy Idol. Weren't there any women? Oh, wait, over there. Dr. Ruth? But she had the smallest hand in the world. I uncomfortably sat on the horns of the dilemma, wondering how I was supposed to fulfill my fantasy. When I spotted her name, Marie Osmond. That would do in a pinch. I held my breath as I pressed my living hand into the tomb-like imprint. My God, her paw was a perfect fit. Who would have thought it? A fantasy fulfilled in Fargo. Maybe some people wouldn't be as impressed as I was, but let's not forget, Marie did have her own summer replacement television show. She was a little bit country. I was a little bit rock and roll. Sam could have his baseball. I had Marie. I met Sam in front of the Roger Maris Museum. His Mariner's cap was on sideways, and his Detroit Tigers t-shirt completed a perfect picture. He looked like an advertisement for the American League. He was way more excited than I was. Oh, man, this is better than anything. You should have seen the baseball mitts. I would have killed to have those. I could have stayed here for a week. 
We're supposed to meet the band at the Shooting Star Casino and Lounge in 15 minutes. Porter Wagner is playing one room, and I think Rich Little is playing another. I was getting pretty jazzed. Drinks were either cheap or free in a casino. The band was waiting for us at the Shooting Star. Everyone was gambling. Marty's eyes were fixed on the slot machines. He was working the arms on those bandits like the whammy bar on his new guitar. I said hello, but he didn't hear me. Lenny was dressed in black, shuffling the cards and trying to put the make on the good-looking dealer behind the blackjack table. Vinny stood behind Lenny and got a vicarious gambling thrill by looking over the man in black shoulder. There was no way he was going to throw his money away on gambling when there were shoes in the world that could still be bought. Sam and I headed for the electronic poker games inserted in the tables. The setup was kind of like poker television. I was soon addicted like anything else that was bad for me. I was winning enough money and the waitress brought enough booze to keep my interest. The heavy silver dollars would clang as they hit the metal dish in the bottom where my pay dirt was temporarily housed. I had never gambled before. Ooh-wee, now this must be why people live here. This is what I call fun. Yeah, ya betcha. I did it again. I wish I had more details. The drinks were stronger than I expected. After the sixth or seventh drink, I entered some horrible dark place that was new to me. What it was, I wasn't sure, but I knew I didn't like it one fucking bit. I remembered three things. Sam laughing like Pee Wee, Porter Wagner's jacket being so bright I thought it was last call and throwing up outside the Fargo Dome. I couldn't remember how I got in bed. I still had all my clothes on. My head was pounding. I wasn't sure I could lift the receiver to call Sam and ask him what happened. My hand shook as I dialed the phone. Sam answered with his usual greeting. What's happening? Hey, Sam, it's me. Did I do anything last night to be embarrassed about? Nah, you just got drunk. I heard something in Sam's voice that I had never heard before. Concern. This scared me because Sam was always about having a good time, and he didn't have a judgmental bone in his body. Well, how did I get home? Did you drive? Yeah, but you put up a fight. You tried to hit me a couple times, but you finally saw it my way. Oh, Sam. I wouldn't hurt you for the world. I'm sorry. Please. I just had a little too much to drink. Sam was quiet. He and Paula were my strongest allies. I would die if I thought I had disappointed Sam in some way. The worry came through the phone. I'm worried about you. I want you to think about taking care of yourself. If you keep going on like this, you're going to do something really stupid. Something you can't undo. Jesus. He had a lot of nerve. Who did Sam think he was, my fucking father? I was beginning to get tense, and I'm sure my voice showed it. Whatever, Sam. I was just out having a good time, and it got away from me, that's all. I hung up the phone and began to cry. Not the whimpering that I would occasionally allow myself to do, but real, honest-to-goodness tears that seemed heavier than me. This was a bad career move on my part. Later that day, I had the biggest show of my career. What was I going to do? I looked at the clock. It was only 11 a.m. At least I had the entire day to lift my head from the pillow. Oh, man, this was a bad one. I laid there and tried to remove the embarrassment from my mind like a cobweb. I would simply whisk it away, only to have the cobweb reappear as if I had brushed it in the wrong place. Even if I could have done something about the uncomfortable thoughts, there were only more paranoid ones to replace them lurking in the dark corners of the lair. Thoughts of Bo. How much I needed and missed him were caught in the web. I couldn't stand it anymore. The situation called for desperate action. I was going to do something I rarely did before. I got up and drank cheap whiskey straight out of the bottle. A little hair of the dog was the only way. I had a belief that if you didn't drink in the morning, you weren't a drunk. It was the second time I was breaking one of the few rules I actually tried to follow. As soon as my head started to clear, I remembered the whirlpool and complimentary breakfast served until 2 p.m. The whiskey was a magic potion. The heat of the booze pumped through my veins and brought with it courage, denial, arrogance, and relief. As I got dressed, I thought to myself how Sam was worried about nothing. He just needed some time to chill. I headed down for the whirlpool. After drinking the whiskey, the aches that were left in my body evaporated with the swirling pools of water. It felt safe to allow the thoughts to come again. Who was I kidding? 
I knew I would have to cool it. I would lay low until Spokane, but once I got there, I knew there was no way I could stay straight through that leg of the tour. There had been too much history in Party Town. I leaned back against the hard, wet tile and wondered how my life had come to this. What I did know, I was tired of paying the outrageous price. The only solution I could come up with to stop my head from thinking was heading back up to the room to catch a nap. There was a sound check at 3 p.m., but I would beg off. I needed to privately lick my wounded ego. When I felt better, I would give myself a talking to. As soon as my head hit the pillow, there was a knock at the door. God, I couldn't talk to anyone. The pounding in my head had returned in a consuming and definite way. I sat up and watched the neon sign across the street. The bright lights were flashing off and on in absolute sync with my throbbing skull. I feel like shit. I will be okay. I feel like shit. I will be okay. I feel like shit. I will be okay. The neon rhythm was hypnotizing. I heard Paula's voice. Lena, it's Paula. I know you're hiding in there, girlfriend, so just get busy and open up this door. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. When I opened the door, I could see the concern and love on Paula's face. I knew she had me in her prayers, and I'm sure I'd been in them for some time. At the moment, I believed they were beginning to work. I could feel the Buddhist spirits flying around my head. Paula took my hand and sat next to me on the bed. It's okay, girlfriend. You'll be fine. It's just time for you to get better and get healthy. You are going to begin a new way of life. I can feel it in my bones. Paula's words were soothing. So soothing, they sounded more like meditation. Her voice was moving around me in circles. The tones of her prayer-like voice were sinking into my pores. Each word was sticking to the side of my heart like a barnacle. Oh, I still wanted to fight it. I didn't want to give in. How could I have been so wrong for such a long time? I learned an important lesson that afternoon. There is no way you can become enlightened and at the same time, Keep your ego. It's either one or the other. I started to cry again. How did I end up like this, Paula? How did this happen? I was just putting one foot in front of the other, and I ended up here. I didn't want my life to end up like this. I'm so fucking afraid. Paula held me. Girlfriend, you're not afraid enough to yell, uncle, but you are damn fucking close. All you've done today is admit to someone that you have a problem. She was right. I have never admitted to anyone, including myself, that I was feeling any less than perfect. Very much like AC. I'll go get you a salad, girlfriend. You need to eat something healthy so you can feel better. Again, I knew she was right, but all I wanted was a pizza. A heavy meal would take my mind off my aching head. Life had brought me to a place where no matter what, I wouldn't be happy. Even the road didn't seem to be enough to fix what was wrong anymore. Because after being on the road for a while, the ache in my heart would return and home would seem like a friendly place again. I always had a list, and whenever I got what was on that list, it was a signal for me to make a new list, leaving me in a constant state of wanting more than what I was getting. While Paula was gone, I realized that the band must have talked to her. There was no other way she could have known. The embarrassment was crawling up my spine again. The spiders had returned, each one carrying a scary thought on their backs. Paula returned soon with our seafood salads in hand. After we ate, I fell asleep while Paula watched the clock. Roy Orbison was a couple of hours away.